four wheels, sevens across, three $15,000 jackpots. Do you have any idea what the odds are? Shoot, it's gotta be in the millions, maybe more. Three fucking jackpots in 20 minutes? Why didn't you pull the machines? Why didn't you call me? Well, it happened so quick. Three guys won. I didn't have a chance to call you. Did you see the scam? You didn't see what was going on? Well, there's no way to determine that, Yes, Sam. there is. An infallible way. They won. Well, it's a casino. People gotta win sometimes. Hey. Ward, you're pissing me off. Now you're insulting my intelligence. What do you think, I'm a fucking idiot? You know goddamn well somebody had to get into those machines and set those fucking reels. The probability on one four-wheel machine is a million and a half to one. On three machines in a row, it's in the billions. It cannot happen. Would not happen. You fucking Momo, what's the matter with you? Didn't you see you being set up on the second win? I really you, think you Wait, you're... you didn't see that you were being set up on the second win? I really think you're overreacting. Listen, you whole... fucking yokel, I had it with you. I've been carrying your ass in this place ever since I got here. Get your ass and get your things and get out of here. You're firing me? I'm firing. You. No, I'm not firing. I'm firing you. You might regret this, Mr. Rothstein. I'll regret it even more if I keep you on. This is not the way to treat people. Listen, if you didn't know you'd be in scam, you're too fucking dumb to keep this job. If you didn't know you were in on it, either way, you're out. Get out. Go on. Let's go. This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast. I am your host, Jason Bishop, and with me today, as always, is Sam Stepanenko. Hello, hello, hello. And Trish Coughlin. Bonjour. And that's pretty much all you're going to get out of them today. <laughs> we're just doing, recording a quick intro because we're giving you one of our Horicon specials today as... Technically, yeah. Trish and Sam are unavailable to record, so we did this back when we recorded the Fast and the Furious episode, just to give you an intro and outro for this episode, and we're going to start our Horicon coverage mm -hmm. with the panel with Joe Bob Briggs. Ah, uh, what a man. Yeah, lots of cool stories to tell. We had a good, a good time at HorrorCon. I got to thank Dan for allowing us to record the panels. I think we're like the only podcast that is allowed to do that. Yeah. So that was really great of him to allow us that kind of access. Unfortunately, being at the panels kept us from doing interviews. So we're going to have to find yeah. that balance. Maybe I'll make Sam record guy next year so we can get some interviews as well. Yeah. But throughout the coverage, of, you'll find more panels, uh, episodes like this in the near future. Mm -hmm. We did get a few vendor interviews and another chunk with Joe Bob with his Q&A at yes. the Globe Cinema during the Calgary Underground Film Festival. So we'll try to attach that with some of our vendor interviews from HorrorCon down the road. Yeah. And we've done a lot of movies. Like if you watch The Last Drive-In or Monster mm -hmm. Vision from before that, his drive-in sensibility shares a lot yeah. in common with what we look for in a movie that's worth remaking. Generally terrible, but with some cool yeah. ideas and uh, we like that bit of a grindhouse feel to our stuff as well. That can do attitude of small film. <laughs> and the one he did was one we actually had done. That's right. Yeah. When uh, the, the film he introduced at Cuff was for Chopping Wall, mm -hmm. aka Killbots. And uh, we covered that a couple of years ago on this show. And he said a lot of the same things. I yeah. didn't record his intro for that, just the Q&A afterwards. There wasn't much talk about uh, Killbots. But when we were there, it was like, man, yeah, we kind of all, all hit the same notes, yeah. don't we? And then we recorded that before I started watching Joe Bob on Shutter. For the longest time, the only way I could yeah. get Shutter was through Amazon on the PlayStation. And I wanted yeah. to have the live experience with the last drive in on Shutter. And I just couldn't for the longest time. And then I finally invested in a, a Roku box so I could watch yeah. the live channels and watch uh, the last drive in as they aired and interact with people online when the show was going on it's a lot of fun even though the show's pre-recorded and not actually i was about live. to say didn't we find the behind the scenes thing that shattered well we some we, of we your... shattered that really really quick because he's here friday night 
doing a tour. The Horicon hasn't started, but he's already here in Calgary while yeah. the show is going on on Shutter. Yeah. Like, son of a bitch, it's not live. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Illusions so, shattered. Yeah, it's really just yeah. Joe, Bob, and Darcy hopping on Twitter for a second or two. And then, yeah. Well, Bob's not online too much. Darcy will live tweet throughout the show so yeah. you can definitely catch her on there unfortunately she couldn't yeah. join us for the show because her uh, passport and stuff was stolen during another tour and she had the worst nightmare yeah. where it's like all her id and stuff and like that's trying terrible. to get id without id is is turns out to be really tricky yeah. so hopefully we'll get to meet uh darcy the male girl down the road yes. when joe bob hopefully will return he really likes being at the globe and and uh, we would certainly yeah. love to have him back. And if he does, we'll definitely try to have some words with him the next time he is through our neck of the woods. And with that, let's uh, roll the episode. Here is the panel from HorrorCon 2020. <laughs> Whichever one you like. All right, thanks, guys. Well, thank you for being here. Are Welcome. there are there questions? What am I doing? Oh, <laughs> sure. Plenty. Uh, anyone out here have anything you want to ask? Yeah. Uh, nobody really brought up the topic of the Halloween show. Yeah. Like, what is You want to know how I got into casino? Is that? How what? What your experience was with it? How was it? Oh, with casino. I I was in casino between between I got fired from one network and then I got hired by the other network very quickly. And uh, during that period in between, I was going out on acting auditions, and so. Um, one of the auditions, the casting agent called and said, um, we want you to come in and, and read for this uh, Martin Scorsese film. And uh, I said, well, yeah, sure. And so, <laughs> and so I went in and, uh, uh, and, and then I was, I was already nervous about reading for a Martin Scorsese film and they called me back and they said, actually, uh, Marty's gonna be in town. And so I'm just gonna, instead of reading for the casting director, we'll just have you read for Marty. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and so I got my friends to like help me, you know, run over the lines and everything. And then they called back again and they said, well, not only that, but uh, Bobby's going to be here too, so you can just read the scene with Bobby. And I'm going, Bobby, Bobby, yeah, Bobby De Niro. You know, I said, like, okay. And so, uh, so now I'm going in to read this audition with Robert De Niro for Martin Scorsese. I've never met either one of them, you know. And so um, I'm just kind of like all around terrified. And I walk into the audition place, the uh, uh, casting office, and... Uh, you know all those gangsters in um, uh, Goodfellas, all those mafia guys. You know they have those faces. They're all in that room. They're all they're all like waiting. They're all like waiting in the casting room, uh, complaining about their parking because they drove in from Jersey and it's like tell tell Marty these are like killers. You know they look like killers and like tell Marty he has to validate our parking. We drove in from Jersey, you know? <laughs> and so, and you're sitting there with all these killers and they call me into the uh, audition room and um, Scorsese, the first thing Scorsese says to me is, do you think women in prison movies are a genre of their own or is it a subgenre of the prison movie? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, I've never thought about it like that, Mr. Scorsese, but I think it's a genre of its own. And he says, I agree with you. It's its own genre. And so we had this conversation about women in prison movies. What's the best one? You know, it's like, I'm in Chain Heat. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. You know, it's like, not only does he know like every Russian movie ever made and every, every, every uh, you know, art film ever made, but he knows every exploitation movie ever made. So we had this conversation that kind of loosened me up. And then, but I was still nervous because De Niro was coming in. And, and when De Niro got there, he didn't know his lines and he didn't know the scene and he had to use his glasses and stare down at the paper. And I said, okay, now I'm fine. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have to look him in the eye through this whole thing. And so I had it prepared about eight different ways. 
And, um, and uh, so we did it once, and, uh, and Scorsese goes, okay, that, yeah, good. And I, I was like, I, I have seven more ways to do it. Uh, Mr. Scorsese, and he says, well, okay, do one of them, you know, and it's, uh, I did the second one, and he says, no, 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 that's fine, that's fine, don't do it anymore. And usually when they say, that's fine, don't do it anymore, that means get out of my office, you know. <laughs> and so um, I went home, and I thought, well, that was a great experience, even if, you know, nothing happens. And they called me that day and said, hey, come do the role. So it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't much of a role, but it was, it was uh, working with these, you know, with these uh, legendary people, and the interesting thing about it was, since all my scenes were with Scorsese, with uh, De Niro, um, uh, they have to keep the, you know, it takes forever to set up lighting and stuff for a big movie like that. And so they have, and so you sit around a lot waiting. And they have, um, they have to do a security cordon around De Niro. So, cause I guess a whole lot of people want to like have a beer with him or whatever. And so, um, and so for a lot of the times, it's just De Niro and me sitting on stools in the middle of the Riviera Casino in, in Vegas. Um, and there's like, there's nobody with, you know, the, the, the people are about 30 feet away. And, um, uh, and so you have to make conversation. And he's not a big conversationalist. And so I would like try one subject, try another subject, try another subject. You know, and he was just like, kind of like, he doesn't talk a lot. And so, um, finally on the second day, and this like, this went on for a long time. And so for the, on the second day, I said, uh, you know, these extras they hire as cocktail waitresses, the ones today are a whole lot better looking than the ones yesterday. And he says, did you notice that too? <laughs> I thought, okay, man, I found my topic, you know? <laughs> And so from then on, we had plenty to talk about. <laughs> and so, so uh, and then he was a very generous actor, very generous. He was like, um, they do this thing on Scorsese movies. Uh, uh, Scorsese likes people to talk over, talk over each other, you know, st a stomp on the other guy's lines. And so um, you go in the little room that Scorsese has, and you do the scene, and then you, you know, and you talk over each other, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and then Scorsese said, that one, that's the one I want, or that one, the last one he did. And so that's what we did, and, um, uh, and oh, the other scary thing about um, uh, De Niro is, um, he says, he says, uh, uh, Joe Bob, I want you to like, uh, get up in my, fa they're gonna do my close up now, you know, where the other actor is not, scene he says uh i want you to get up in my face i want you to get right up in my face and so that you know uh, so that my face will show the a reaction and go ahead and scream at me if you want to you know and so and then when we turn the camera around for your close up, close up i'll do the same for you <laughs> <laughs> And then we broke for lunch, and all through lunch, I was, I was going like, oh, no, no. De Niro was going to get in my face and scream at me, you know. And so, and he did, you know. And so, um, uh, so that was it. So we did the. I think we had three scenes, and uh, one of them, one of them was one of them had Don Rickles in it too. It was like that was another legendary thing for me because I was like sitting in the makeup room with Don Rickles, and. Um, I said, uh, Don, uh, I, I loved your work in, um, and this is a Roger Corman film. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I loved your work in um, uh, X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes. And, and, he, and, he, and he says, you're killing me. You're killing me. Why are you talking about that? You know, he's, he's like, that was like his early career. He didn't want to think about it. And, and I said, oh, I know all those movies, the movies you did for Corman and the movies you did. Start, I can't believe you're telling me this. You know, and he was, he was like, he was, he was um, constantly on, constantly funny. You know, he was the only guy that um, could like make fun of De Niro, you know. He, you know, De Niro would come on the set and he would go, ah, there's big Mr. Big fucking Academy Award. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and he says, "Yeah, you're not going to remember any of us. You know, you're going to be getting the Academy Award next year. I'm going to be up in the third balcony, row triple X, saying, hey, Bobby, Bobby, remember me?' <laughs> you know, and he's he was always like just needling him, needling him, and um, and uh, De Niro, he doesn't really laugh. 
he does like a silent laugh. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's not making any noise, but he's laughing. And he would like do that with Rickles. I know, that, sorry, that's that's stupid stories about casino. <laughs> uh, that, by the way, that movie plays all over the world all the time. I don't know what it is about that particular movie, but that's an old movie. That's like, what is it, 93 maybe? You know, and it pl it continues to play all over the world. And I was in Prague one time, and this guy says, <laughs> this guy comes up to me and says, Casino, Casino. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he says, and he says, um, uh, he says, were you stupid or were you on the take? Yeah. <laughs> and which is actually a question I asked Scorsese. I said, "Am I re am I just kind of dumb, or am I involved in a corruption thing with my uncle?" And um, Scorsese says, "Well, we don't know, do we?" <laughs> so. I was gonna say one of my favorite bits on the, the last drive-in is when you say "roll film." Continue talking. Oh well. <laughs> that's. Which, which, I just wanted to know. It maybe it's a silly question, but did, like, how did that develop? Well, it started by accident, and then, um, and and then it just became a thing that was expected, and so, and so, and it all. You know, it's convenient for um, talking about unrelated subject matter that needs to be talked about. Um, um, you know, that doesn't fit w the segment, you know. And so, and so occasionally, if I've written down something that I want to talk about that, that like doesn't fit in the show anywhere, I'll just kind of glance at the clipboard and go, oh, this is a good place. And, and by the way, I wanted to mention, you know, I'll just do that. <laughs> so. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I do have a question for you. Okay. Back in 1986, starting out with uh, the drive in theater. Yes. Uh, You aren't old enough to watch drive-in theater. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, yes, well, uh, the movie channel, I don't think anybody here knows what the movie channel is, do you? Yes, no, we do. Did you have the movie channel in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Really? It's you TNT. did? We didn't get TNT, so we didn't get Monster. Okay. Well, in the, sta in, in the States in the 80s, Everybody had HBO, and it cost 10 bucks a month. It was not cheap. And then if you were a movie fanatic, you added Showtime, which was also 10 bucks a month. So you're spending 20 bucks a month just to have these premium channels, you know, with no commercials and the latest movies. And then if you were crazy, you also ordered Cinemax, which was also 10 bucks a month. And then if you were just out of the world insane, you would get a fourth channel, and that was the movie channel. So the movie channel was the fourth premium channel. If you wanted to spend 40 bucks a month on premium channels, you would get the movie channel. And so we didn't have a big footprint, but, but we were, we were, um, uh, anyway, the, the way I started there is I, I'd gone down to, um, the set of um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 to write an article for Rolling Stone magazine on Dennis Hopper because Dennis Hopper had been in rehab for years and he was coming out of rehab. He, like, he hadn't worked in three years, coming out of rehab. And the first movie he was doing was Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And his, by the way, his agents and managers were horrified that that's what he was doing. And he, but he wanted to... He wanted to spend the summer in Austin playing golf with Willie Nelson, <laughs> and that's why. And that's why he did Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. And so I went down there to do this article on him, and um, uh, and the article came out, and the Movie Channel was looking for um, a cheap way to host these movies, these crappy movies that they had bought over in Europe. Um, they used to go to the Milan. Uh, film market and buy these big packages of movies like you only want 
uh, it's like there's two good movie. There's a 40 movie package and two of them are good. And so in order to get the two good ones, you have to buy the 38 bad ones. And so they would bring these movies back over to the States and, and, um, they wanted a way to host them. And, and so it's like, Hey, this guy writes about B movies and he's, um, he just did this thing on Chainsaw Massacre 2 for Rolling Stone. Let's see if he wants to be a guest host. So I went and I was, um, I was a guest host for a month, for four weeks, uh, you know, one, one, uh, double feature each week. Um, and, uh, it was, I, all I had was my, my, my entire set was a lazy boy recliner with steer horns on the back. That was it. And, uh, and, um, they liked it. And so they invited me back for the next month. And then they invited me back for the next month. And they invited me back for the next month. And I never had a contract. The thing just, kept, <laughs> they just kept inviting me back. And, um, at, over time, we would add things to the, to the uh, set. So, uh, they were, they eventually started filming it at this, um, this old studio. I don't know if anybody will, will recall this or maybe it's, uh, students of television history, but there was a network in the, um, fifties called the Dumont Network that, that was, uh, had a big, its big headquarters studio was in, uh, Spanish Harlem, uh, in uh, Manhattan, which had become a, slum and um the the studio itself had become a slum and so the the movie channel used that old fallen down uh studio uh to film the 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 show and their other hosted hosted segments and so for we we would just keep adding things to the set we just left the set up all the time and so we just keep adding things to the set and one day I was walking by the back of the set. I was walking around the back of the set, and I noticed we were using this, the uh, flats from the old show, The Honeymooners. <laughs> and so, and uh, they they were still there from the 1950s. They just painted them, painted over, painted over, painted over. And um, so, uh, um, eventually, all the other hosts on the on the show got fired. Um, and. Um, I, uh, I said, I was just, it was just little me in this little corner of big sprawling Spanish Harlem studio. And, um, I, I finally said, you know, I, I can go to the public TV station in Dallas where I was living at the time and just shoot this thing for probably 10% of what you're spending on it. And they said, you know what? Do that. And so, and so I just took over the show and took it to Dallas and, uh, did it for most of the years of, um, the movie channel and Monster Vision, uh, in Dallas at, um, actually ended up shooting it at this uh, studio that was, if anybody remembers this, Ross Perot ran for president. And when he ran for president, he built a TV studio. I don't know why he would do that, but he did that. So he built this TV studio and then after it was over, nobody wanted to use it. And so you could get really good rates on it. It was like a state of the art, like fancy studio. And so, um, we use that. Uh, that's where my show was for most of the time I was on Monster Vision in Dallas. And, um, uh, the only other, uh, show that was ever shot there, I don't know if you have this in Canada, was Barney the Dinosaur. <laughs> and so, so we were, so the same, so Barney the Dinosaur was probably like, 12 feet away from where I was. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know if I forgot the original question. Anyway. No, no you were answering uh, it. Right. right into Monster Vision, so that's awesome. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of like, going back and getting fired, you know, tell us about the Dallas Times. Uh, the Dallas Times Herald? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I started writing about exploitation films at the Dallas Times Herald. I was a regular film critic and then, uh, uh, I was actually just the relief critic. I, I was, um, uh, doing it for a period of time so I could stay in town. And, um, I noticed that they weren't reviewing any of the movies that played at the, exclusively at the drive-in. And they had great titles. I mean, you know, graveyard tramps, uh, you know, uh, they bite, they squeeze, they're ready to please graveyard. Tramp. That was the poster. Uh, and so I said, you know, um, 
why aren't the studio, this whatever you know company owns this movie, why aren't they screening it for me? Because they all the they would always screen the movie for the critic, and so I would call them up and say, uh, "I want to see your movie," and they would. But by the time I knew the movie was in town, it was gone from town, you know. And so I would call this this studio and say, "Next time you have one in town, let me see." Oh, we never let critics see our films. That that's what almost all these distributors said. Um, and so I started going to the drive-in to review the film. I go on opening night and um, and started doing this column called Joe Bob Goes to the Drive-In. And um, uh, it became uh, uh, popular but mainly because it was I was the only person reviewing these films. There was nobody in the whole country that was reviewing these films uh, other than fanzines, you know. So there was certainly no newspaper guy that was reviewing the films. And in fact, the newspaper critics considered them trash b- below their uh, contempt, you know. Um, and so um, uh, in 1985, when um, um, the We Are the World song was everywhere, I wrote a parody of it called We Are the Weird <laughs> as, as the top half of my uh, column for that day. And um, it got, uh, uh, it, it created a protest um, by the uh, local black community as being um, anti African and anti black. And so I didn't think it was at all. It, uh, but anyway, the, the columns, I, the, my, my column had become curmudgeonly, and therefore I was making fun of virtually everyone and everything. And so this was the latest thing. It was making fun of the We Are the World song, did this parody of it. And so um, it created such a ruckus at the paper that the, the um, publisher fired me. He, he, he fired me for the drive-in work, but not for my regular work at the paper. I, mean, I was a reporter. So he says, no, no, we want you at the paper, but we're firing this column. And I said, well, then I'm resigning in solidarity with this column, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, um, and so uh, that, was the, that was the story of the, of the We Are the Weird controversy at the, at the, at the Dallas Times-Herald in 1985. People that were in Dallas at the time still remember it and still, talk, still mention it when they see me, <laughs> you know. What? Well, it was it was a shaky it was shaky for a while. I mean, I was out of a job, and I was I was um, um, I had started um, I was getting these Im- speaking invitations. You know, come speak about movies, and so I would do these invitations. You know, you get a little honorarium, make a little money doing that, and um, I got this invitation fr- from a guy in Cleveland to do a whole a whole show, and I didn't really have a show. But I needed the money, and so I said, you know, okay, I'll be there. And I felt like, you know, I've never been to Cleveland. I don't know anybody in Cleveland. If I bomb in Cleveland, who cares? And <laughs> I'll just go home. And so I did this show um, in the fall of uh, 1985 at the um, Berea, Ohio Convention Center, which is actually the Berea, Ohio High School that's, in, that's right by the Cleveland Airport. And uh, so for my very first performance, very first show of any kind, I had about 800 people in the audience. And it was, it it was horrendous. It was terrible. I had, fortunately, I had this, I had written all these country music parody songs, and I had a band. And so when I forgot my lines, I could go and sing a song. And so we had this, um, in fact, if there are any punk fans in the audience, uh, my my band was called the the Joe Bob Briggs All Cousins Hillbilly Band, but <laughs> but the their real their real jobs uh, were th- they were a band they were a punk band called Stick Men with Ray Guns that used to open for the Butthole Surfers and they were they were a pretty heavy punk band at the time, but um, it's like um, guys who play punk drummers who play punk can't drum worth a shit for a country for a country western song so we were always kind of we were always like a little off the beat so anyway um 
so that was, and, and the promoter ran off with the money. He ran off with all the money. So, so I mean, was it a good career move? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, after I finished that one show, I was like, I'll never go do another show again. But then um, uh, this club in uh, San Francisco, Wolfgangs, there's this club, called, a punk club called Wolfgangs. They, and they wanted me to come there. And I started doing shows there. It was, uh, I, I was the only um, uh, non-band that ever played the club. It was, uh, it was the, the Fillmore West guy, um, what's his name? Phil Graham. Phil, Phil Graham, yeah, it was his club. It was Phil Graham's club, and uh, he was really nice to me, and, um, uh, and he, they would always book me into this punk club, and, uh, and that's kind of where I started, you know, developing shows, uh, and then I and then you know I told you the story of how I got hired at the movie channel. So so uh, once I started at the movie channel, I was there for like eleven years, and we never did define what the show is. So it just kept growing organically, and you know had no time limits. I'm the only person I have ever heard of that has been on three network shows and never had a time limit. <laughs> never been told when I have to stop talking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Between all the shows you've done, do you have like a favorite episode that you've recorded or a favorite movie that you've reviewed? Um, I don't have a favorite episode so much, uh, but I know that I know that um, probably the favorite episode of of the audience has been um, the um, I did a Friday the Thirteenth marathon on uh, on uh, Monster Vision. And I did a, um, I, when I hosted the film The Warriors, everyone seems to remember that particular episode because I had a New York City subway map and I showed exactly where the Warriors were at, at all times during the movie. And, you know, it's like, why would they go, why would they go down the east side, you know, where all the stockbrokers are when they could have just gone over the west side? And, yeah, you know, it was like, and it was like, you know, and, uh, it, it was, um, uh, there were there were some episodes that just became um, you know you can you can always tell because somebody like records them at home puts them up on YouTube and they get ninety seven million views you know you know okay that's the one that everyone likes so but you know but when I was at the monster at, at Monster Vision and at um, uh, the Movie Channel I did. It wasn't like today where everyone tells you their opinion immediately as soon as you're off the air. You know, it was, a lot of times you just felt like you were in a concrete room throwing stuff out into the ether and you didn't, you didn't really get any feedback. Or if you did get feedback, it was like a year later. You know, you didn't, you were just, you didn't know who was watching the films. I know a lot of prisoners were watching the films because, <laughs> And and I never understood this, but I would get this mail from these certain prisons around this around the states, and um, I'm like, I'm on a fucking premium channel that costs ten <laughs> ten dollars. It costs ten dollars a month. How do you get this in your cell or wherever they watching it? They're watching it in the day room. And finally, I talked to this um, uh, uh, warden who says, um, "Oh, we, we he says we love the movie channel." Because you show all that exploitation shit, and there's no commercials, and they'll just watch it for hours. They'll just watch it for hours, and it's like, okay. <laughs> and it's like, warden. Well, by the way, wardens love TV. You know, every time you read about some legislature saying uh, we want TV out of the prisons, you know, the wardens hate that. They hate that. Well, the wardens want as much TV in the prisons as possible, <laughs> and and uh, they think that. Keeps keeps them happy, keeps them peaceful, keeps them from killing each other. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. uh, so, what's one of your favorite things that a fan has sent you, and what's one of the weirdest things that a fan has sent? Oh, well, one of the weirdest things that a fan sent us is that thing that we actually showed on. I mean, I think we showed it at was it at, was it at Christmas or? I forget when we when we put it on, but um, I, now I didn't recognize it as a sex toy, but it, but it was it was a taxidermied 
raccoon on one end of a metal thing. <laughs> the other end, I later learned, was a butt plug. Now, <laughs> I thought it was just, here's the thing you hold to like do a raccoon puppet thing. <laughs> and, and Darcy's saying, that's not what it is. That's not what it is. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it does look, this part, this part on the bottom does look kind of strange. And she, finally she says, it's a butt plug. You know, <laughs> okay. And then I said, okay, what kind, I overthink things. Why, what kind of sexual fetish would you have to want a raccoon in your butt? <laughs> and, and the way the raccoon is facing, and it is a real raccoon, it's a taxidermied raccoon. It's like, he's coming out of your butt. <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, I guess that would probably be number one on the list of things that people say, oh, Joe Bob will think this is cool. You know? <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, I, uh, best thing I get is, uh, I, I, I'm, I, one time, uh, my, my, my favorite, uh, whiskey is wild turkey. And, uh, especially the Russell's Reserve that, uh, Jimmy Russell, Jimmy Russell's, uh, master distiller at Wild Turkey. He's been the master distiller for 66 years. I don't mean he's 66 years old. We don't know how old he is. He's been the master. He's supervised every bottle of Wild Turkey for 66 years. And he has this Russell's Reserve stuff. Anyway, um, uh, one time I made a remark that I like uh, McAllen 15-year scotch. And ever since then, people will show up and give me a bottle of... Well, now I now have so much McAllen 15 scotch that I can't possibly drink it. I, I actually, I actually um, you know, give it for auction and stuff when, when, when uh, it, it seems appropriate. But, um, uh, but the, the, those are the best gifts when I get whiskey. <laughs> so. Is there a movie you really want to do a deep dive into, but you know Shudder will never have the rights to it? Oh, there are many movies that we want that we can't uh, that we can't show. Not not only because we can't get the rights, but some studios have this um, part of their contract that says you can't interrupt the movie. Um, MGM is that way. Lionsgate is that way. So we have to rule those movies out in advance. I mean, we just can't even go there. Um, uh, we actually are two weeks from last night. We are showing Halloween three at the uh, at the uh, drive-in jamboree in um, Memphis, Tennessee, on opening night. Because I gave I gave Darcy the, the it was Darcy it's supposed to be Darcy takeover night on Friday night of the uh, jamboree, and so not only does she book Halloween three, but she gets Tom Atkins. Stacy Nelkin, the director Tommy Lee Wallace, to all show up to make it four against one. <laughs> so we're finally going to show uh, Halloween three, but I, at least I get to make my case, <laughs> you know. And and listen, I'll, I'll try out. One, here's one thing I'm going to say. All right, um, you know, letter. You know, everyone says um, uh, it was a great idea that John Carpenter had to have a different movie every Halloween. Okay, John, do it on number two. Don't do it on number three, because if you do number two with Michael Myers, in, in other words, have number two be John Carpenter's new Halloween movie, Season of the Witch. But at the same time, here's our spin-off Michael Myers movie, you know, and it's Michael Myers goes to college, you know, Michael Myers scared stupid, Michael Myers meets Ma and Pa Kettle, Michael Myers, dude, just, just do these Michael Myers movies forever, but don't call it Halloween. If you want to do a Halloween anthology, then don't do Halloween too. Start it with, you know, start at the second year, you know. So starting at the third year, everyone goes, what the fuck? You know, <laughs> so so there's that, and then there's the fact that, like, I really like the Stacy Nelkin character in the movie. I really I really like her. You know, I think you know, strong woman on a quest. To, you know, to find out what happened to her father and everything. And then you find out she's a robot. She's a robot. And when did, 
Was she a robot the whole time? Was it a the trick to get, you know, Tom Atkins under, under control? Or, you know, what did she become a robot when they took her into the, what? There's no scene showing her transforming into a robot, you know. And so when people say, um, you know, if it had just been called Season of the Witch, it would have been acclaimed as one of the greatest horror movies of the 80s. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's got all kinds of th strange things wrong with it. You know, um, the very first scene, the guy runs into a gas station in uh, Southern California, right? And then you go to the hospital, it, it, it ends up being taken to the hospital um, where he, Tom Atkins is the doctor. Um, in the very last scene, Tom Atkins runs to the same gas station and screams, stop it, stop it, stop it. But he's in Northern California. And then I think, unless he sprinted 400 miles to be in the gas, to get, it, to get to that same gas station. So there's like weird stuff in the movie, you know, that's like, you know, there's good stuff too, but, and, and also the Dan O'Hurlihy character, the, the uh, Irish, uh, um, the, uh, the Irish mastermind behind the masks. Um, what's his goal? What's he doing? You know, is he... Is he a robot? Is he a druid? Is he a, you know, does he just hate Halloween? You know, does he just hate children? You know, there's never any exposition scene saying, well, here's why they stole part of Stonehenge to, ch to chip pieces of it and put them in children's masks that explode in the child's face and cause snakes and bugs to come out of his head. They never explain that. Okay, good. Good effects idea, you know, needs a story behind it, I think, you know, so, anyway. Uh, so, before every film, you always do a, what I call my movie tally. You're yeah. axe foo and exploding head foo, and is that something that you personally put together, or do you have help? No, no, I do that. That, that was, that's something that uh, started... Uh, that, that, that's something that just grew organically, you know, as, as the weeks went on. When I was first writing the newspaper column, you know, I would count the dead bodies and then started counting the breasts and then I started, <laughs> then started counting the motor vehicle chases. And it actually developed from a series of conversations that I had with uh, Roger Corman because um, Roger Corman was the only filmmaker who was a fan of the column. He didn't say, never review my films. He said, yeah, please review my films. And so um, I had quite a few conversations with, with Roger, and Roger loves to talk about specifics of, of how to make movies, you know. And he'll, he'll say things like, um, you know, um, you, need, you, need, uh, th you need three girls who will all uh, agree to above-the-waist nudity. Uh, Two of the girls will appear in one scene apiece. One girl will appear in two scenes. Those four scenes will leave the impression with the viewer that he has seen a lot more than he has actually seen. <laughs> uh, so he had all kinds of formulas like that. He says, there must be an action sequence within the first 12 minutes of the film. Um, all films should be um, 82 minutes or fewer because if you go to 84 minutes, you require five film cans to move the film around the country, whereas you can get the film into four reels if you stay at the 82-minute mark. And he, he was like, he had all his, thereby saving 20% of your shipping costs. You know, he was like, he had all these formulas. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this as drive-in totals, you know. And so that's how that stuff developed. Oh, I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know what happens if 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 there's a dead animal in the movie, and I mention it in the in the in the drive-in totals, everyone is like, "Oh, I was gonna watch the movie, but like a dog dies in the movie." They don't care about the people, you know. It can, the the body count can be 167, you know. It's like one dead cat. Oh, I'm not watching that, you know. It's like, <laughs> Uh, yes. 
What is it? What is the movie? Kiss meets the Phantom of the Past. I have not seen that movie. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, send it to me. <laughs> Hi. Oh, um, I, I, uh, probably about, um, probably about 60, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, if it, if it were up to me, I would, uh, the, for the, this one, for example, um, is a, uh, is a handmade Native American, uh, uh, bolo tie, uh, made by a uh, made by a Navajo Creek, a member of the Navajo tribe and the Creek tribe, um, uh, named um, uh, uh, Larry Duke. And um, uh, and this is what I t uh, prefer to wear. I, I almost always wear um, uh, bolo ties that are made by either the Navajo, the Zuni, or the Hopi. Um, uh, however... Um, people send me novelty uh, ties, and so I wear them to make that person happy, or to <laughs> because they're the thematic, and so it's a Halloween tie or whatever, you know. But given my given my preference, I would always wear the Native American uh, bolo ties. Uh, bolo ties are like a fairly uh, recent thing in history. They were invented in like the 1930s or 40s, but there are places, and I b I bet. I would bet you that Alberta is one of these places. I don't know, but 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 there are places in um, in the states, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Wyoming, Montana, where this qualifies as a tie. I mean, if you're arguing before the Supreme Court, this qualifies as a tie, you know. And so, uh, and, and in some places, it's the they have an official bolo tie, you know. I would expect Alberta to be the same way, but I don't know if they are. Anyway, they, get, they make good hats. <laughs> this is this is a great hat. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, I, I developed an interest in these, and because I hate regular ties, you know, and and these these just make sense to me. So. Hey. Hey, I was just wondering um, if you had a particular favorite horror movie that involved heavy metal at all. I know it was in film, Jeff Yazin, Rock, uh, Rock, Rock, any kind of movie where maybe it was like a central plot point or something? Yeah, I like all the ones you said, but, but um, you know, when they put heavy metal in a movie, it's never that heavy. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not really, you know, it's just like when they say something's punk in a movie, it's not really punk. You know, I, I, I used to go to those punk shows in the in the early 80s and, and you, you, your life was in danger at those shows. You know, you know, I would always like stand as far back from the from the pit as I could, you know, because you, you, they were truly dangerous places and the and the music was truly um challenging you know and that's not what the what they do they always tone it down in the in the movie like for example rock and roll high school they say that's they say the ramones are punk i mean it's does that really sound punk you know rock 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 and roll high school rock rock <laughs> i you know is that, yeah punk man the ramones you know it's like i don't think so so um so i i, I can't really think of one where they've really uh, you know there there are there are there are composers that use that use um, metal music as sound in uh, horror films. You know horror film music is more about sound than it is about you know th songs. I mean you you don't really have songs in horror films. You have weird sounds, and the weirder the better. And sometimes they'll use metal music, uh, but they'll distort it. How many people pick the movies for Shudder? Oh, I have zero creative control. I mean, I can I can make a suggestion and maybe they'll agree with me. Um, uh, but um, 
uh, I don't really have any control over what they buy and what they license. And um, I mean, I, I give them a request list, and some, and sometimes we get some of those. Um, but um, no, at, when I was at uh, TNT, that was owned by Turner Networks, and Tur and Ted Turner was still the boss of it. And Ted Turner had bought MGM's library in the early 80s. And then he bought uh, five or six other film libraries. So we had a book this thick of stuff that he, that he just owned. You know, we didn't have to license it at all. Uh, but a lot of the stuff in the book, I would go through the book every year, check, check mark, check mark, check mark. Uh, but a lot of stuff in the book, they wouldn't run because it was either in black and white or it was too old. And there's, there's a fear in TV that if something is in black and white, people will surf out. If people, if something is too old, people will surf out. Um, and so I could never show Todd Browning's Freaks. Could never show it. We owned it. We were, we're the only ones that had it. You know, um, there were, there were a lot of 50s, 50s sci-fi. I couldn't show it. You know, it was too old. You know, black and white. You know, so, um, uh, but, I have to say, I had a lot more uh, chances to grab stuff at um, TNT than I have at uh, Shutter because what happened is, you know, if you went to Paramount in the 80s and, and said, you know, we want to put Friday the 13th Part 4 on TV, they would say, oh, really, will you? It'll cost you $15, you know? <laughs> and then today, it was like, Oh no, you can never get that. <laughs> you know, it'll be, it'll be, uh, uh, no, that's worth millions of dollars because we have a streaming contract with, uh, you know, for every Halloween with, uh, this guy or that guy or whatever. And, um, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that horror has become mainstream, I blame Shape of Water. <laughs> <laughs> Once Shape of Water won the fucking Academy Award, it was like all these guys that had never looked at horror in their life, you know, uh, said, oh, you know, the, the CPA types at the studios, you know, they're saying, hmm, Shape of Water, rubber suit movie, oh, uh, hmm, we have a lot of those, <laughs> you know, and so suddenly stuff became expensive, and, um, uh, so it's it's hard for a little thing like Shutter to uh, uh, you know have to justify the expense of every movie, and so that's why we work a lot with uh, places like Vinegar Syndrome and um, Arrow Video and um, the places that have sort of uh, Blue Underground uh, companies that have uh, sort of grabbed the the rights to older, out of fashion. Uh, films that they then make into cult films by doing a lot of shows at Alamo Draft House and places like that. So, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many films were like totally forgotten. They're, they'll be totally forgotten in 2010. And by 2015, it'll be a cult phenomenon and they'll be on midnight shows everywhere. You know, so, I mean, tonight we're showing Chopping Mall at the, at the, at, here in Calgary. You know, well, probably if you went back to say 2008, nobody wants to see Chopping Mall in 2008, you know. So, uh, but now it's like it's cool, you know, so these movies become cool again. That's very accurate. Yeah. That's very accurate. Yeah. Um, well, there. Uh, when I when I first started doing my newspaper column, um, uh, Joe Bob Briggs was. Uh, I, I do this thing that a lot of newspaper. I was doing this thing that a lot of newspaper writers do that I wouldn't do today that I don't really approve of, and that's the fake naive. And I was doing a fake naive with uh, Joe Bob Briggs. I was making him dumb. And I was making him a dumb redneck. And so, um, 
as time went on, there were a lot of things I wanted to write about and talk about, and I couldn't do it in a fake, naive uh, voice. And so I just started adding intelligence. <laughs> I just started adding intelligence to Joe Bob's character. And by the time I got to TV, it was like, uh, you know what? If if I want to talk about French philosophers, I'm going to talk about French philosophers. You know, <laughs> it's just. But I'll, but I'll do it in a Texas style. You know, I'll do it in a in a in a uh, down home style. And so. That's how it evolved. I never said anything that I didn't believe, but I greatly exaggerated many things, you know. So it's like, I don't hate Halloween 3, you know. <laughs> but if you ask me on TV, I'll say, I hate that movie. <laughs> so so um, things like that, yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And everybody who doesn't know about the show tonight, it's at 7 o'clock at the uh, Calgary Underground Film Festival. And also I'll be at the table for a couple more hours. And that was the panel from HorrorCon 2020. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Thanks mm -hmm. to Dan from HorrorCon for allowing us access to this. And uh, we hope you enjoyed that panel live from HorrorCon. And uh, We were in the room. <laughs> we were right there. We were right there. And uh, hopefully, well, most definitely you will got, got more to look forward to from HorrorCon. We got like five more panels yet to come. Yes. So lots more cool stuff yet to come from HorrorCon. And uh, we'll trickle them out throughout the year. We're not going to overload you with it mm -hmm. all at once. So uh, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled program next week. Don't forget to visit our website. Invasion of the remake dot site dot com slash podcast. And over there you can get t-shirts, mugs, posters, PPE masks, and so much more with lots of cool invasion designs and movie posters and that sort of thing. Um, lots of cool stuff there. Very comfortable. You'll love them. Follow us on our social media at Invasion Remake on Twitter, Invasion the Remake on Facebook and Instagram, and Invasion of the Remake at gmail.com if you want to send us your suggestions, your corrections, your comments, and your fan challenges. If you want to give us a fan challenge, a uh, couple rules. They got to be at least 20 years old, the, the movie. Shouldn't be too good. I mean, I don't want to do a famous, highly rated movie. There's no nothing I can do with mm -hmm. that. That's already a good movie. But if you send us a bad one that has... Good, good roots, good bones. We can certainly work mm. with that. And um, the weirder, the better. We like weird. That'll definitely up your chances of getting that movie made. You know, mm. check our list. Make sure we haven't done it already. <laughs> exactly. Think of it like a house. If it has a good foundation, we can do something with it. Yeah. But if that sucker is a teardown, it's a teardown. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes you can give us a good movie that we've never heard of before and trick us into doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's always fun too because we're like, you son of a bitch. This is, <laughs> I, I don't want to do anything to this. So yeah. good. So, but you know, it's exposed us to some really great movies we love talking about as well. Yeah. So 20 years old uh, or older, which now is starting to dip into the 2000s, which makes me a little uncomfortable, but. <laughs> we got old. I don't know how this happened. You're right. Not too good. Uh, and, and, and try to source it for us. Like, if you know it's on a streaming service, try try to help us find it. It'll certainly up your chances if we can easily source it for the episode. Mm -hmm. Rate us and review us on your podcast of choice. Give us five-star rating. It helps get more. Earballs. On the show. And I think that's it for housekeeping. We'll be back next week with a full episode. Until then, I've been Jason. I'm always Sam. And I continue to be Trish. And we are out of here. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. We are Drive-In Mutants. 
We are not like other people. We are sick. We are disgusting. If life had a vomit meter, we'd be off the scale. We believe in blood, blood. in breasts, breasts, and in beasts. We believe in Kung Fu City. As long as one drive-in remains on the planet Earth, we will party like jungle animals. We will boogie till we puke. Heads will roll. The drive-in will never die. Amen. <laughs>